from like a perspective as a mom, you know, I want our sons to grow up in a community where they feel empowered, independent, and safe. And you know, the, the flip side of that is, is that like as a mom, I'm not gonna be taxiing my children to practices. They can go by themselves on their bicycle. They can go out with their friends and go to the ice cream shop and go to the bakery and go to school. And again, I have more freedom as a mom because I'm not spending hours of my day shuttling my children. But I think people need to look at all these people trying to get around my bicycle and understand, you know, it could be a father or a mother, or a brother or a sister or a son to somebody. And like these are people that are trying to get around and if they're upset that they're on bicycles on the road, then these drivers should also be helping ask for change push for separated bike lanes, and if they choose to use their vehicle, which is totally fine, then they can now be on a road that is separated from the bike paths, and we can all live together in harmony. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman, and that is Ashton and Jonathan Schottler from the Black Forest Family YouTube channel. And we're talking about creating a culture of activity uh, from the context of a German village, a German town. Uh, I'm really excited about this, so let's get right to it with Ashton and Jonathan. Enjoy. Ashton and Jonathan, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Thank you for having yeah, us on. Thank you. <laughs> what I love to do with my guests is just give you an opportunity to introduce yourself to the audience. So let me turn the floor over to you two. Ladies first. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, so my name's Ashton. If you haven't caught our channel before with the Black Forest family, my face is usually the one who's mostly on YouTube, although like we try to do videos too where Jonathan joins me or he does a few solo videos here and there. But my background professionally or from an education perspective is uh, I have a master's in architectural studies. And then mid last year, I wrapped up a PhD in human geography at a, the University of Freiburg here in Germany. So essentially what a lot of my work in academia has focused in on is the intersection of political economics and urban development. So my dissertation, for example, looked at how the low-income housing tax credit actually changes the ways in which developers develop low-income housing within cities, um, how it incentivizes them to build, how it disincentivizes to build, and how that affects the geography of where low-income people will live within a city. Because as um, you've explored on your channel with many of the topics that you've touched upon, um, where someone lives has a direct impact on so many outcomes for their life, as well as um, things like job opportunities and schools for their children. And so um, professionally, that was kind of my background. And then I, um, I've taught at the university level in the US and Germany. And so in an interesting way, I think for me, what starting this YouTube channel was able to provide is sort of another platform to continue that like researchy education teachery part of my brain but by talking about topics that look more or less at the intersection between like Germany and the United States or different European nations in the United States and how they tackle everything from urban planning to politics to government workings on how they design cities and um, cycling infrastructure and yeah we've, we've kind of covered like a whole range of different topics on our channel but I think all of them sort of surround this idea of all of the different elements of what go into life whether that's in the U.S. or choosing to live somewhere abroad. Yeah. Yeah and as Ashton said um, you see my face every now and then on the channel. My name is Jonathan um, and my education background is actually mechanical engineering. Um, I got my bachelor's and master's of mechanical engineering at University of Missouri, same school as Ashton. Um, and I've been now working in the cycling industry for 11 years. Well Ashton has a good broad depth of experience and knowledge all around. Mine is very much dedicated to cycling and also some cycling infrastructure as well. Um, I'm mostly focused in working on 
performance bicycles for um, elite athletes and professional racers. Um, and I basically will start these projects with some consumer research, move into concept phase, design phase, into manufacturing, and then testing um, and mass production. And then I find my excuse to ride my bike as much as I possibly can. And that is essentially my passion in life, living on a bicycle. Yeah, yeah. And we sort of alluded to it a little bit in the name of the channel, the Black Forest family, uh, but we didn't actually say it. So where are you reaching us from? <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're located just outside of Freiburg and Breisgau, which if you ask the Germans, technically Freiburg is not the Black Forest. It's on the edge of the Black Forest. It's right where... We like to tell people, if you're trying to find us on a map, we live right where Germany touches France and Switzerland. Ah, down, yeah, the down far here. far southwest yeah. corner. Yeah. A very beautiful area that we basically also call the boulder of Germany. Yeah. Yeah. This is where a lot of professional athletes live. This is a very nice cycling culture and a very much live outdoors type of community. I love this too. And it, you'll notice that I have the cycling infrastructure map uh, on Google Maps turned on. And so you see the bright green uh, sort of popping on the screen here. And, and that's the cycling network. And uh, I've been in your neck of the woods. I've uh, uh, taken the Active Towns uh, channel to uh, Colmar, uh, right across the uh, the river and the border there in France, and then also up in Strasbourg. I spent a lot of time in Strasbourg uh, documenting uh, the cycling culture and the infrastructure there. So yeah, this is what a beautiful part of the uh, the country. What a beautiful part of Europe to be in. Yeah, we feel very lucky. Freiburg is such a really fun city too, I have to say, because it's a it's a university town, mm -hmm. which, you know, it's just like the States. A university town is sort of its own separate thing from like just yeah. a normal city. There's a certain vibrancy that that young people tend to bring, whether it's like with art and culture and music. But Freiburg is known within Germany as being the green capital okay. of Germany. Um, and that one is like a play on where it's located because it's in pretty much the black forest, the green. but also yeah. because, yeah, but also it's, um, it's a like politically, I think the greens are the dominant political force. And then also like, right. it's kind of a hippie town. Yeah. There's a bunch of like, everything is really geared towards recycling, energy efficiency, green technology. Get around by bicycle is the big one. Yeah. Having yeah. a car and trying to navigate by car is so difficult and so much slower than getting around by bike. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. For us, so it's, it's a, a hippie, really it's a nice hippie town. town, just like Boulder, Colorado. Yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. I think, I think the statistic that this city loves to say is that there are three times as many bicycles as cars. Yeah, yeah. Which is... And before we hit the record button, we were laughing because we realized, uh, Ashton, you and I were in the same race in, in Boulder. We were. That, that yeah. was Ironman Boulder. The first year the official Ironman uh, was held in Boulder, Colorado. And so I had to do that race. I actually had technically retired in 2012 when I did Kona. And I'm like, I got to do it again because my hometown, because I consider Boulder my hometown, even though I don't live there anymore. Um, I, I have to do that race because all my friends were doing it and or were part of the uh, the, the team that was pulling the, the race together. So I you know, when you sent some photos over, I was like, oh, I remember that day. <laughs> That's great. Now, did you Small also world. do uh, some uh, triathlons there, Jonathan, or are you just strictly a bike person? Strictly a bike person. I try to okay. do a lot of long distance racing. So here in Europe, I've done a lot of long marathon mountain bike racing. And then Kansas, um, there's a race now called uh, Unbound Gravel, which is a 200 mile gravel race, which I've been on the podium a few times. So my focus, I guess, towards the end of my racing career, I was never a professional, but it was always a long distance events. Yeah. And I use scare quotes on my r racing career too, because I was slow. I was just an age grouper. Uh, uh, Ashton, you did quite well. You were on the, uh, the podium. <laughs> well, yeah, it the, just the one time. <laughs> it, was, it was, it was fun. I think someday I would love to do another Ironman again, but it's, it, it's, it's, a. Uh, 
to get to that distance and to be anywhere close to competitive, it takes so much time. So oh, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's another part-time job easily. So, yeah. Okay. So absolutely. I've zoomed out on the map here for Germany uh, just a little bit. Is there another Freiburg, Germany? Yes. Yeah, there's another one in the eastern part yeah. of Germany. Yeah. Because I'm going to be there soon. I'm going to be, uh, I'm flying into Berlin and then I am going to Velo City, the conference right here in, in Leipzig. And it looks like there's a Freiburg ah, right cool. down over here. So there's just a, another Freiburg very close by. So yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. 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 Technically, I think like, the, I think like if you look on, like if you're trying to buy train tickets, for example, it's always like yeah. Freiburg in Breisgau. But th don't right. confuse it also. There is one in Switzerland as well. So make as sure well. you buy the right train tickets. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So like not even joking. Um, right. If you like flew into Zurich because you it, honestly yeah. like Zurich is just as close as Frankfurt if you're flying into this yeah. area and you're buying a train ticket. Yeah. Um, it's so easy to buy a train ticket to Freiburg, Switzerland yeah. and not yeah. Freiburg and Breisgau. And it, yeah, yeah. And explain this to multiple people that yeah. almost went to the wrong place. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what's funny was when I was in Colmar and Strasbourg, that was in 2015 and I had, uh, I was there for over a month. And so I actually had a, a Euro pass. And so I, I was just traveling by rail all around, uh, all around Europe. And, uh, I could totally see making that mistake and <laughs> going, which which Freiburg am I going to? I don't quite remember. So I'm, I actually am kicking myself a little bit that I was that close to Freiburg and didn't stop in. It's a, it's a great city, really. I mean, we, we feel pretty lucky to be able to call this part of the world home. It's, I mean, it's one of the best cycling cities in Germany. And Germany already is well known for cycling cities, not so much as Holland, um, but it is extremely good. And if you ever get the chance to come back, just yeah. rent a bike and go and ride around. You're going to be absolutely blown away by it. Yeah, no, I spent quite a bit of time in Germany. I had friends. Uh, I, I actually stayed at their her house, in, you know, for several days, and we explored all over. And we did make it up to the other college town, uh, Munster. And so I, I shot some video up in there. And uh, it was a rainy day, but it was still, you know, wonderful tootling around on our bikes there. So. Yeah, that's good stuff. Okay, enough of all this map stuff and, and, and all that kind of stuff. We, we, now to, let's, let's get to the real heart of the matter. Uh, you two are content creators now. You had mentioned your, your history in, in your PhD and in your teaching and everything. First two things, I guess, is A, how did you both end up in Germany? And then B, how did we end up getting the uh, the YouTube channel? So let's start. How did you end up in Germany, and then we'll we'll shift gears to the the, the YouTube channel. So I'll start first because I moved to Germany first. Um, I basically landed my job at a bike company straight out of my master's degree. Um, after one year, they gave me the opportunity to move to Taiwan and go spend three months there, just being in the factories every single day. And from there, we had a small satellite office here in Freiburg, um, and they gave me the opportunity to come here for two years. And once my two-year visa was up, they just kept extending it and extending it until I had a permanent contract. And I've been now in Germany for almost 10 years. Yeah, 10 okay. years to Spain. Yeah. And, yeah. Which, yeah. and which, which company is that, Jonathan, real quick? Um, so I worked for a company called Cannondale for 10 years. And okay. for the last one year now, I've been working for Specialized Bicycles. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, when Jonathan and I first started dating, I was actually teaching at the University of Central Missouri, which is a mm -hmm. small state university uh, in very small town in Missouri, very different from <laughs> where we currently live. Um, and, uh, so a lot of our relationship early on was, I mean, long distance essentially. So a lot of the, the photos that we had shared with you, a lot of the time was we got into this like groove of, if we have to travel to see each other, why not start going to some places that were like fun and interesting? So like we joke that our third <laughs> date was to, well, <laughs> I mean like we, we had to get on a plane regardless, right? Right. Yeah. So, yeah, totally. uh, like our... Yeah, we joke that our th it was true, but our third date was like a trip to Puerto Rico. Uh, and then like we ended up going on a big trip to Nicaragua and that's where we got engaged. And then we did some hopping around Europe and yeah, like it was just sort of something that we both really bonded over. And um, 
at the time that I was working for the university in Missouri, um, I hate saying this because it sounds really like superficial, but um, I only had a master's degree at that time, which for most people is is a very high level of achievement. But like in the academic world, you're not really eligible for promotion unless you hold a terminal degree. So I knew that I needed to go back and get my PhD. And so it was just one of those things where it sort of worked out that we had been together for a year. We had decided we were going to get engaged and try to get married. And so I started looking for PhD programs in Germany. And Switzerland, actually. And Switzerland. I mean, I was looking all over just to try to get a spot. And by really just luck and meeting the right people, I actually got into a PhD program in Freiburg. So... Um, we were, I was able to come over um, is, with that. Everything just sort of kind of fell into place. We were, we were very fortunate in that regard. Yeah. And this is from uh, t- uh, 2019. Those earlier photos were from Nicaragua. Uh, and, yeah. and this is uh, just just a few years ago, just immediately pre-pandemic <laughs> in 2019. Uh, and yeah. Uh, yeah. So Okay. So that's fascinating. So we, we, we settle into the groove in, um, in Germany. And uh, Ashton, what year was it that you actually made that move? 2018. So 2018. So you had a couple mm-hmm. years there and then the, then the world really changed uh, in 2020. <laughs> yeah, we actually, um, we had our pandemic baby. <laughs> I found out I was pregnant and then yeah. quite literally Freiburg shut down one week later. Oh, it, wow. Oh, it my was, gosh. It was, it was crazy. So our son, Jack, we, he, he was born um, November 2020. Yeah. And uh, that was a whole experience in and of itself. Just like, I mean, yeah, e- everything you think to, ex- I mean, it was my first pregnancy anyway, so I didn't know what to expect, but it definitely wasn't <laughs> during a pandemic. Um, but it's, it's been, it's been fun. Thankfully things have eased up a heck of a lot since then and things have changed quite dramatically. Yeah. But yeah. Um, and like basically the, the Black Forest family also originated because of the pandemic yeah. as well. We were actually, we were on a vacation in the Seychelles um, February, 2020. Mm-hmm. So we were reading our phone, the news, everything going on in China. And we're just thinking, mm-hmm. well, that doesn't sound yeah. so good. And then we got yeah. back to Germany <laughs> and that's when everything just went south. And we basically decided, let's make a website. We kind of wanted to do it, just tell about traveling because we were, you know, we wanted to travel around the world and record it, but we wanted to share all of this experience with our family. So that's actually where the website started. And it really just started changing and evolving from there. Yeah, I think like initially a lot of our early videos were more travel oriented because that was sort of what we had been doing prior to the pandemic. Yeah. 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 That's fascinating. It's a, it's amazing how similar your story is to uh, Jason Slaughter's story uh, with the YouTube channel, Not Just Bikes. His whole reason for starting the YouTube channel, Not Just Bikes, was to try to communicate to all those people, his friends and family, who were questioning him and his wife for moving their family from the Toronto area into Amsterdam. And, and, and he's like, he was originally doing it in tweets and he was on Twitter and he was tweeting out and he was like, no, this is too limiting, you know, 140 characters and short little videos. Uh, and so he, on a lark, you know, that's what he did is like, all right, I'm going to start a YouTube channel. And then, you know, it's blown up since then. I don't know if you follow, uh, not just bikes or not, but he's closing in on 1 million subscribers now. So it's really been amazing. Yeah. And, and my channel exists simply because, uh, you know, I brought him on early on in, um, uh, not early on in the podcast, but early on in the YouTube uh, environment for Active Towns. And that caused, you know, my channel to blow up a little bit, which was very, very nice. So I've had the honor to uh, interview him three times now, and including one of the times uh, an on-bike interview, which is one of my favorite things to do. Oh, is oh to, that's awesome. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, we're big. We're big fans of his. We watch his channel all the time. He has wonderful content. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. It really is great. Okay, so we're on your landing page. So this is the landing page for the YouTube channel itself, 
And we, we see uh, you guys are doing a, a rock star job. Closing in on 50,000 subscribers at this point, you're halfway to that magical 100,000 subscriber no. number. <laughs> we can't believe it's like happening so quickly as well. Yeah. We were not expecting it to take off the way it has because we actually started this channel less than two years ago. We yeah. had our website yeah. going for an entire year before we decided to open up the YouTube channel. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's been about a year and a half since we posted our first video. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. I, I, congratulations, you guys. This is absolutely amazing. And the content that you are producing, it kind of fits into that. You, you mentioned it's all over the place in terms of the types of of narratives that you're going into and, and talking about. And I loved how you said, Ashton, that this is like helping you exercise that sort of academic side. And I could tell in the production of your videos and some of the things that you're covering and the level of depth that you're at, you're definitely taking a prof professorial sort of approach to it. Well, I, I'd, I'd hope so. I mean, that's something that I, whenever I look for content, it's one of the things that I really like in Not Just Bikes mm -hmm. is whenever he talks about a lot of his topics, he brings it, of course, he brings it from a personal perspective always. He's always talking about what he's experienced and what he's seen, but he also provides really great context in the form of like, whether that's like the history of why something is happening the like every once in a while there'd be like a statistic like sprinkled in here or there and it's from a place of perspective where it's not speculative right but just sort of saying like here's how things are here's how they got to be that way and here's why it's important to like think about the bigger picture of you know whatever subject he happens to be talking about and I think like that's something that we find yeah. also very interesting and try to incorporate into our videos. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Ashton does pretty much all of the research for all of these videos and she's extremely good and proficient at it, but it's always a focus for us to keep everything fact-driven, data-driven and as unbiased as possible because we can create content and people can come up with their own opinions. Um, and that's really one of the reasons why we wanted to start this as well. Every time we go home, we have a lot of family members asking questions about being in Germany. We explain it, but it's so much easier to really just make a video and put the data on the screen and tell the story in a very clear, easy to watch way. Yeah. And that's what I th why I think your, your channel is so incredibly popular. It's why Jason's is so incredibly popular, too, is because it's not just about bikes. <laughs> you know, it, it really is, uh, you know, a very, very broad thing. And, and he used to joke about that and say that, yeah, you know, I kept getting this question. And so I dove into that and I can totally see that, you know, when you, I look at these things like poverty in Germany and gun laws here, you can totally see that it's like stuff not only ripped from the headlines in terms of like critical issues and that are happening, but it's also probably, like you said, Jonathan, it could be like, you know, these questions that keep popping up saying, now, what is it like to really live there? <laughs> so. yeah. yeah. And, and I think too, like we also try on a couple of occasions to talk about like biases that we had before we moved here. I mean, you know, you can't help uh, but know what you know. And when you, both of us come from the Midwest, we're both from, pretty pretty sheltered kind of bubbles of middle America. And there's often, like I found at least that like, you know, whenever American news organizations will talk about things that are happening abroad, particularly in Europe, they're always like anecdotal. They're never really anything that's like truly in depth. And so like there wasn't necessarily like, I don't mean ignorance in like a bad word, but I feel like, you know, I truly didn't know. Um, what it was like to work in Europe. How does healthcare work in, in Europe? How does, I mean, yeah, all of these different topics. And so a lot of it too, with these like research videos have, we've also drawn upon like, what did I not know before I, I moved here and what was really eye opening for me? Yeah. Yeah. I want to, you know, kind of uh, hone in on, on a couple of different themes and, and channel you in, uh, Jonathan, you know, on, on this, this particular uh, uh, video that you did. Uh, and, and this, of course, is the, the car replacement and, and talk a little bit about that trend um, that we see, you know, in 
you know, worldwide, globally, and you talk a little bit about this in the in the video here uh, of some of the e-bike trends that we're seeing happening in the industry, and uh, and it really took off too. Bikes in general took off during the pandemic, but e-bikes really took off, and you do do a really good job in this in this video too of. It's not just about the sport bikes. I mean, we're talking about transportation bikes. We're talking about cargo bikes. We're talking about family bikes. Talk a little bit about that from your perspective of being in the industry of how much of a game changer this is for hopefully getting more people on bikes more often. Dare I say, maybe even in North America? (laughs) (laughs) No, that's a, that's a really, really good question because when I started working in, the, in this industry 11 years ago, there were e-bikes, but there was not really an explosion of e-bikes at the time. Like these industries were basically driven by racing bicycles, adventure bicycles, all based off of pedal power. Um, but now recently, sustainability has become a very hot topic around the world and getting people outdoors on bicycles has become absolutely critical. Um, but people still have a fear of getting around and pedaling themselves and getting sweaty where they're going. Uh, But now the e-bikes are around, like people don't have to think about that anymore. They have a bike with some assistance, but at the exact same time, they're still able to get a workout. It's up to them how hard they want to push the bike. Um, But I mean, just moving on from a standard um, city bike, you can now go out and buy a cargo bike. You can buy a short tail, a long tail cargo bike. You can buy basket bikes. I mean, DHL, for instance, here delivers packages by bicycle and by cargo bike because really one of the most expensive parts of delivering a package is getting into the city and trying to navigate the vehicles through town. Um, But now cities like here in Freiburg, like they are so open to building the infrastructure to allow people to get around and get to work, get to school absolutely safely with separated bike lanes, with dedicated bike lanes, bicycle parking. Um, It's been really an interesting thing to watch. And like you said, um, COVID bicycle explosion. Every single company, we could not keep enough inventory available. And of course, immediately after that, there was massive shortages because of COVID outbreaks in the factory. So we couldn't necessarily meet the demand of all of the customers. But it's really just been kind of fueling a change as well, because not just focusing our efforts on racing bicycles, um, it's become abundantly clear that the growth of e-bikes is exponential and the money that needs to go into development is city bikes, e-bikes, active living. Racing bicycles stay pretty steady, like they're still popular, they always have been, but e-bikes, is, it's really been a fun thing to be a part of because there's a lot more opportunity. Yeah, I mean, when you think of it from just a market perspective, if we imagine that maybe around 1% of an entire population might, you know, be in the market for a high-end racing bike, if that, uh, you you know, when you start to think about a city bike, a family bike, a a cargo bike for mom, uh, and, you know, all of a sudden, oh, well, gosh, now we start looking at statistics of there's a whole interested yet concerned group of people in a community. And if there were safe uh, and inviting opportunities to ride, like what we see right here in this image uh, that's scrolling by, then suddenly, Ashton, you might feel pretty comfortable about grabbing the kid and going for a ride. Yeah, I mean, it's it's been pretty it's, it's been really cool to experience that because we just recently moved to like a smaller village just outside of Freiburg. And yeah, like I would say 75% of the time, 80% of the time I take our son to and from daycare with a bicycle because it's faster. I mean, it, it really is, especially because we live in like a really old village. So it's got a lot of like those twisty, turny, like really narrow streets. So if somebody's coming the opposite way, you've got to like pull over and get over. But it I mean, really, though, I've even seen where, like, my parents, for example, uh, my mom recently retired, and they went out and bought e-bikes, which is really cool, and that's been something that they've been exploring more recently, and I think, too, like, this e-bike thing, it's it's just expanding opportunities for people to get outside um, and to, to go longer distances and to, like, seek that out more often. It doesn't... I mean, of course, like you can do it for fitness, but it doesn't have to be for fitness. 
Right. Yeah, and exactly. Like I ride bicycles for fitness, but I own e-bikes because I don't always want to ride a bicycle for strictly, you know, fitness purposes. I just yeah. want to get from point A to point B. And it's up to me how hard I actually want to push. Yeah, or pick Jack up from or, daycare. <laughs> yeah, I mean, even like um, when Jack was in a daycare about 20 kilometers from our house or 12 miles, I rode my bike there with the trailer with my road bike back and forth, which was a fantastic workout, by the way. Um, but yeah, the infrastructure made it possible. And it really wasn't that much slower than the drive, which is the funniest thing. Right. It, it's it's funny too. A lot of things change when you become a family, and and I'm sure this this happened for you guys. And so this is you know a, a wonderful video that you put into into place, a uh, talking about what it's like for families to be going for that active mobility option a little bit more frequently. I know that that it wasn't a complete surprise, but were you are you kind of surprised by the the level of empowerment that you all have of being able to as a family unit now be able to get out and ride? Yeah, I mean, I would say like that was a if you want to talk about like culture shocks of moving to Germany, a huge one is the independence that smaller kids have when it comes to cycling. Like, I didn't grow up in a large city. I grew up in a smaller town, again, in middle America. But because there was no infrastructure for bicycles, like, even though my elementary school was maybe just a mile away from our house, I never rode my bike to school, ever, because it wasn't safe to do it. I would have had to have crossed, like, a county highway. There wasn't, like, even a sidewalk that I could have ridden on if I wanted to. And so it just wasn't even something that, like, I would have thought about. But here in Germany kids will like there's a whole transition phase they go from kick bikes then they move to pedal bikes on the sidewalk and they move to a little bit bigger bikes in front of mom and dad on the road and truly like by the age of eight most kids are biking by themselves without parental supervision to and from school because it's safe to do it and they even have in Freiburg there's actually a um, a bicycle school that they take the kids to, to learn all of the rules of the road on what different signs mean, on what like the etiquette is, on what to do or what not to do. And it, like, it really is so empowering from a small person's perspective to have that kind of independence, to just be able to go out on a bicycle on their own, to go to like the park or to go to school or go to a bakery and that's something that like, I know I sure never experienced when I was no. in the U.S. And I think one of the important things, too, is we want our children to grow up seeing everything around them. We don't want them sitting in a car just like looking at a window and a B pillar like you don't you want them to f experience like the, the actual air and also just to get out and exercise mm -hmm. to get from point A to point B. And like we don't have to live off of a car culture all the time. Um, I think it's just giving them. The empowerment to get to the places they need to go to by themselves and not always rely on a vehicle. Yeah. And what's neat is in this video that we're, we're kind of uh, seeing some images pass uh, past our, our conversation here, you were, uh, you're, you're, you were just pointing out that arriving at the zoo and you ended up finding out, oh, we don't have to pay anything because we didn't drive. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's cool too in Freiburg. Um, they've actually made in our city here, the vast majority of the urban center is pedestrian only. Um, and so they really try to actually keep cars now on the periphery. Um, and even like there's still some streets that are even off for bicycles during certain periods of the day because they have so many like large crowds of people. But um, I mean, you know, like, like a lot of cities in Europe, they're very compact and it is true. You get around the city so much faster by bicycle than you will by car. Yeah, for, for sure. sure. It's so stressful driving around here by car and it's really almost kind of done on purpose. Um, and Freiburg like 20 years ago was mostly all vehicle with like car. Um, there was no bicycle infrastructure. Mm -hmm. It has come a very long way in a short amount of time. Yeah, they've been a really great model, I think, because I, like that's actually something that I think someday we would like to make a video on is how cycling culture actually grew in Freiburg. Because I think like sometimes we look at European cities and think, well, like, well, they were probably always that way. And like Freiburg's a hippie town, but it wasn't always that way. Yeah. Um, like there's these huge, you know, great 
play spaces now and green spaces and community spaces within the city center. Like there's one, um, the Alta Synagogue plots that like it's part memorial, but it's part like water splash pad for the kids in the summer just to hang out in the city. That used to be a parking lot. That wasn't like a, a fun space, but like even cities within Europe are actually a pretty cool model for showing like it can be done. You, you can do it. You can enjoy being outside, not stare at cars all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think that's the, it's a, a very good point that you made there. And yeah, that would be a wonderful video to, to produce. And it is helpful for viewers from North America, from, you know, other car dominated societies, Australia, New Zealand, other places where they look towards towards the Dutch and towards the Germans and, and, and the, the European cities and just to make that assumption that, oh, it must have always been this way. It's like, no, I mean, when you look at the 1970s and what they had to go through in the Netherlands uh, to, to really kind of fight to, you know, push back and claim back some of that space that had been ceded over to the automobile. Yeah, it's it's quite astounding. And it's I'm not surprised to hear that you see a similar sort of timeline and narrative happening in Freiburg uh, because, yeah, t- the automobile has that insidious way of, of taking over the space, if not held in check. And Germany is a car country. I would say, yeah, you, yeah, you they can't, love they, their cars. they love, yeah. and that's the thing too, like yeah. Germany, yeah, the, the Autobahn, I mean, Mercedes, Volkswagen, the Audi. Car like, culture is still very strong. Right, yeah. absolutely. And and I think like there's, there's an argument to be had where of course, like, you know, those companies are making a shift towards more greener technologies as well. But like, there is a model that shows like how these things can work together and work in tandem with one another. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, and it comes down to that that concept of um, urban design and livability and communities. And nobody wants to have an autobahn right outside their door. I mean, that's not a pleasant environment. Yeah, no, not even here. No. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. So with that in mind, talking about urban design, I was curious. I'm like, OK, I wonder what their most popular video is and Boom, there it is. This is illegal in America. So it's very much an urbanism uh, episode where, or, you know, a uh, video. Were you surprised that this one, I mean, we're talking over half a million views already. Yeah, yeah. And actually I should, if I'm going to be honest with why that got so many views, I should give a shout out to Not Just Bikes because he actually shared that video on his platform. I remember, I'm not even joking, I like yeah. randomly rolled over in the middle of the night because I couldn't sleep and I like looked at my phone and all of a sudden we had like, we were getting like 7,000 views an hour on our channel at two o'clock in the morning and I like yeah. woke Jonathan up. I'm like, what is happening? Um, <laughs> but but in, I mean, in all serious, I think like what really resonated for a lot of people in, in that particular video is something that I talked about in my own dissertation was like the role of nimbyism. Like in my dissertation, I had more to do with low income housing, but, you know, nimbyism or not in my backyard, it, it rears its head in so many ways. It doesn't have to necessarily be low income housing. It can be, you know, whether it's putting in uh, public transportation infrastructure or making your city more walkable. And uh, like that particular video, I think like we also spoke quite a bit about how like Germany even today and the newer areas in which they develop still make it human centric. It's not just the old parts of the city where they had to be human centric because the only other way to get around was by foot or by horse, but even the new developments that are going in around all of the major cities that we have in our area, they're still planning okay, how do we fit in bakeries and how do we fit in daycare centers all within pharmacies, all within walkable distances from where people are living so that you don't have to have a vehicle to get around. And just what that does, like we spoke earlier about kids, like even with kids, what that does for kids to have things that are within walking distance that they can safely get to and from and that yeah, and it's yeah. just, but you also talked about the culture, like USA is very much a car culture and that's what you need to get around. You cannot really get around by bicycle currently in most cities very safely or easily. In suburbs, yeah. In suburbs, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Now, so obviously in the Netherlands, we saw a, a big difference between what was happening prior to World War II and then World War II happens and then what happens post-World War II and then the you know, sort of the, the shift and the, the greatest example in the Netherlands, of course, is, is Rotterdam, which was pretty much destroyed in World War II from the bombing. And they built back based on plans that were already in the works on the automobile. And so they doubled down on this concept that we're going to have wide, wide roads and high towers and everything. And and they went forward with those plans post, post World War Two in in through the 1950s, 1960s, and into the 1970s. They doubled down, and they they built Rotterdam up to be more modern, more looking like a North American modern city. Around about the 1990s and, and early 2000s, they realized they made a mistake, and they're now they're trying to make it more livable, and they're trying to reverse course. Did we see some similar types of situations that you know of in um, in Germany as well, where that that period of time immediately post World War II, when cities were new cities being built, like new greenfield development, or new cities being rebuilt after the war, started doubling down on being car friendly and car centric? In in my experience, it's it's a very city by city basis on okay. on which plan they chose to move forward with. Freiburg specifically largely rebuilt in the exact same footprint as they had before. Right. But other cities chose to do what Rotterdam did in expanding that way. I think, you know, Freiburg is a bit unique where we live too because it was mostly the very like city core that mm -hmm. was bombed. Interestingly, it was bombed twice, once on accident by the Germans because <laughs> they thought they were in France. Yeah, it was so close. And then yeah. it was so close. And then a second time, the, mo the the larger one happened was like, a, I think it was called like Operation Tigerfish. And they really took out the majority of the like urban core of the city. And so what I think is actually quite fascinating is like they actually chose to try to rebuild in the exact same footprint mm -hmm. that they had. And I think that's actually why the city is still such a fun tourist spot today is because even though it was destroyed, it still retained a lot of the same character that they had pre-war. But Freiburg is one of those interesting cities where in modern Freiburg, there's always a, like, I think I mentioned before that like, you know, the Green Party is the like dominant political party in Germany. And it shows a lot whenever like new developments are even being proposed. There is um, one that's been going on for like a decade now called Dietenbach that they still haven't broke ground on because Freiburg is growing a lot and it's experiencing these growing pains. And so Dietenbach is a new neighborhood that they're proposing that would actually start go expanding out the the city border it's not infilling but filling out on the edge and the pushback from the citizens saying is this really what we want to be doing or do we want to really continue to grow out why can't we grow in what does this do to the the natural environment what is this going to do for a strain on our public transit system what is this going to do to our watershed area in a very like Freiburgy way, they protested it by the farmers drove their tractors to city hall and parked them on the front lawn. Like it's 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 a, it's like a very like grassroots kind of thing. But like like even and I feel like I don't know how to explain this too. The there's so many things with Freiburg that like I feel like from an American perspective, things that are done here are so green. But for a lot of Freiburg, they're still like, no, we could do better. Right. So like they'll they'll shut down the city with like bicycle protests. Oh yeah, protests. the main highway through town. Like yeah. Basically, they've shut it down multiple times, and it's just bicycles going down the street. Yeah, because right. they're still pro. Like they're still like, ah, we don't want to have these like cars with emissions coming through anymore. So let's yeah. just shut down the highway and ride our bicycles down the highway. Right. Which is yeah. So talk a little bit about that because that's one of the challenges. You know, when we when we look at 
trying to take bold steps to change what our built environment looks like, including adding bike lanes, taking steps to, to reduce the number and the speed of motor vehicles traveling through um, our cities and past our houses, we get a lot of pushback from the status quo, uh, the motoring public, um, and, and and obviously some of the powers that be. And but how, how what's what's that spirit? It sounds like in Freiburg the spirit is protest. You come together as a group and yeah. and and be vocal about it. Is that a is that a very German thing or is it more regional and it really depends on the situation? Um, I'd say it's super German. We actually have a video on this on our channel where we talk about protest culture in uh, in Germany. So we talk about um, just how prevalent like protest culture is something very different uh, from a German perspective versus an American perspective, because an American perspective, there seems to be on some level, no matter what you're protesting, right or left, there's like this subversive thing that's like, well, like protesting is inherently un-American. Like if you're protesting, then like somehow you're saying that we're not doing things good enough. And that's, that's like, I mean, like if you should be proud of where you live and like if you're protesting, I don't know, like there always just sort of seems to be this like sub subliminal thing of no matter what it happens to be. You're being un-American if you're protesting. The status yes. Quo. Yeah. Whereas Which is kind of funny Germany, when you think about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean. it is. It is actually. But, you know, here in Germany, being vocal and expressing yourself, no matter the platform, is your right as a citizen. And it was, I mean, we lived in the city center for yeah. a number of years and there was a protest on something every other week. Um, and, you know, yeah. whether it was Fridays for Future or if it was people who were protesting COVID lockdowns. But that was their right. They were, they were always peaceful. Um, but they, they... Yeah, they had to plan them beforehand. The police were there to escort them front mm -hmm. and back and provide supervision. They were always very, um, I guess, tame, I would say. Yeah, for the most part. I mean... But it's, it's cool, though, to see how, like, that is how, in, in the German culture, in the German mind, this is how I am patriotic. It is by protesting that I am showing that I want to participate actively in politics and my voice will be heard. And we can improve. And we can improve. That's totally the mindset here, which is really, really neat to see. And from an urban planning perspective, one of the things that more recently happened in Freiburg that like you've even experienced was by protesting and by advocating for it, there's a ring road that circles Aldstadt because again, you can't really drive into the old city center much anymore. So there is like this ring road that, yeah, that's literally what's called the, yeah, the Ringstrasse. But um, they actually, yeah, they actually advocated to have one portion of it reduced down to a single lane so that they could use the other lane for bicycles. Yeah, because they had a sidewalk they were putting all the bicycles on, which is far too narrow, especially now with people with cargo bikes and pulling trailers mm -hmm. right next to the cars going 50 kilometers an hour. So they just shut down the lane. It's now just bicycles. There is a lot of um, frustration with people who do not ride bicycles, um, but for the most part, it's been like, okay. Yeah, no, <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, like, of course you'll always hit like You're evening always, traffic, but... Yeah. But it was cool to see like a, a, enough people came forward and said that like this isn't just about, you know, bicycles. This is about safety. This is about like our kids being able to get to and from. And like I don't feel like there are many cities that would reduce down the main road around town <laughs> by an entire lane simply to accommodate bicycles. But they, yeah. they were, I mean, it, and it took years. Oh, it took it a is. lot of adv advocacy. It's honestly but. packed all the time too mm -hmm. with bicycles. The number of bicycles going down through there every day is really pretty incredible. There's always like a bicycle traffic jam at the stoplight, which is <laughs> something I never complain about. It's a really cool experience yeah. actually. <laughs> Uh, well, interestingly enough, I, I, I do see that your second most uh, watched video is actually Driving 101, um, you know, yeah. Germany versus the <laughs> United States. And uh, as I recall, I can't remember which book I was reading. Um, it might have been Traffic by Tom Vanderbilt. I think he referenced how difficult it actually is to get a driver's license in Germany. Uh, can you speak to that a little bit? Or maybe that's what you spoke about in that video. 
Yeah, we did quite a bit. So, you know, American car culture is like 16, you get your driver's license. You get a permit at 14. In Kansas, I had my permit at 14 and I could drive around with my which mom, is which is wild. crazy to think about. Wild. Wild that that's allowed. But it's interesting because getting a driver's license in the U.S. varies so much state to state by what they actually require. Like I came from Illinois. So for me, I actually had driver's ed that was part of high school. It was a class we took in high school. And then we had another semester where we did driving with a driving instructor in high school. But for you, nothing. No, I had to do a certain number of hours with my mom driving around. And then I had to go drive around the block with a... Um, a worker, I guess, at the DMV at the time. And then I had to do a written test that I could take as many times as I needed that day and until I passed. That was basically (laughs) it. But yeah, here in Germany, it's about a 1,500 euro task. So it's very expensive when you're 18 and you want to get your driver's license. Um, And also you have to have a theoretical test as well Mm -hmm. and a certain number of hours of driving with an instructor. Um, I can't remember the number of hours off the top of my head, but it is a lot of hours and that's where a lot of the money actually comes from. And it's Um, it's through a driving school. You can't just like go driving with your parents. Like it has to be with. It's extremely strict too. I've heard stories of people where they open their door without looking for a bicycle coming first and they are immediately disqualified. Yeah. So I think if I remember this, and this was years ago that I read the book, I think it highlighted the difficulty of getting the driver's license. And one of the things that they, one of the narratives that he had in that was that you needed to be able to to anticipate the unimaginable, like a kid running out in front of, you know, in front of traffic. And you, you needed to be traveling in such a way where you would be able to respond to that and, and be able to stop in time. Did you get a sense that it it was that extreme in terms of being able to, to really drive safely and have that level of responsibility? I've, I've always said German drivers are the best drivers I've ever in- encountered in the world. Even when I'm riding by bicycle or I'm driving in our car, the number of people who are on alert 100% of the time is really everybody. Everybody is watching everything going on around them. They are anticipating what the other vehicles are doing. They're anticipating a kid running out in front of them. If there's a child on the sidewalk on a bicycle, they slow down because they're worried about the, the kid might lose control and go into the road. But I think the German drivers are so acutely aware of everything going on around them that they always will anticipate the worst case and they're ready to adapt to it. Well, you know, it's something that we, we've talked about in a couple of videos too, and I think this is really relevant, especially under like the umbrella of talking about cycling. Because almost everyone bikes at, in some capacity here, there is a much greater respect and awareness for cyclists because the people who are driving the cars have also been in the position of the person riding a bike right like so they're they're consciously thinking about them because they've been in both positions they've been riding a bike with traffic and they've been in the car with traffic so like when i'm riding a bike in germany alongside traffic I feel so, so, so much safer than I do in the United States, even with equal infrastructure, even if you want to look at like the best case scenario in the United States of in terms of like an infrastructure standpoint, um, I, I know that before a car ahead of me turns right in Germany, that they look behind them to see if anybody's coming in the bike lane. Always. Always. Whereas like, and then this is no shade to American drivers. It's just not something we typically think about because yeah. Usually there's not a cyclist. And as my mom there, right? usually says, she's in Kansas City now, there's a lot of bike lanes being put in and people treat the bike lanes as turning lanes. Like that's basically <laughs> it. And if you're riding your bicycle in a bike lane, you need to be the one anticipating the worst possible case. Mm-hmm. And I can't tell you how many times of training on the road in the United States, I got buzzed with just maybe a foot away from the mirror, getting yelled at, have bottles thrown at me, just getting spit on, the worst things you could imagine. Here in Germany, I can't tell you the last time I was even honked at going down the road. Um, the only time I'm honked at is if you're riding too wide on a road where it's not allowed. They simply are doing that because you are not following the rules and you should be following the rules. <laughs> I think you guys have, I think you have a, 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 a video too on, on following rules and verboten. <laughs> Is that yeah. part of the culture? I, because that's one of the things that uh, I notice in like Denmark uh, when I'm visiting uh, Copenhagen, they're very much a rule following culture. Is that part of the, the German thing too? Is this a, a rule following culture? 
Yeah, I think so, but it's not just follow the rules because they're there. It's do this because it makes the society better for everybody else. It's a cumulative thing. We all follow the rules. We all benefit from it. Yeah. This isn't just a, you follow it because somebody wrote this rule and you need to you know follow that rule. Yeah, but I mean, like, there's 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 some humor to it too. Like, I I don't know. Like, there there's the there's the aspect that you're supposed to be an example for for children. But then there's also the other bit of it where like American culture is very much like a mind my own business kind of culture. Like if I saw somebody what to do, well, but like, you know, as an American, if I saw somebody breaking a rule that wasn't like a serious rule, like if I saw somebody jaywalking in the United States, I'm not going to go out of my way to be like, hey, man, that's not allowed here. But German culture is like. Well, I had better correct them because clearly they are not aware of the rules. And they'll like, I mean, like you'll get scolded by like a ordinary citizen. It's not like it's the police that are necessarily coming. Yeah. They, they police they themselves. They police themselves. <laughs> Unless yeah. you're in Berlin and then jaywalking is. Just yeah, then they're like, ah, yeah. whatever. But well, like, it, it, yes. it, what's <laughs> funny is you guys both pull up jaywalking, and 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 what's great about that is I don't know if you know the history of jaywalking, but it's essentially a made up rule that in law that came into place from the automobile industry uh, when they started to get pushback and resistance in the United States, and they were like, okay. Hey, we've got mothers and people protesting, uh, you know, the number of kids being killed on the streets in, in the United States. And this was back in the 19 teens and the 1920s and into the thirties. And it was literally a made up rule that was done and put forward by the automobile industry. So it's completely a made up rule, a law that, you know, has been codified that, oh my gosh, you know, people aren't supposed to be in the streets. Well, Actually, there's thousands of years of, of precedent that would say, yeah, people are meant to be in the streets. <laughs> it's the, yeah. the interloper and the, uh, the invader of the space is, in fact, the new invention, the, the automobile. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's part of German culture for sure. I would say the whole like rule following, rule abiding yeah. aspect of it. It's just... It's just part of living here. Yeah, but it, get used to it. it makes life almost easier because you can always anticipate what everybody's going to do. If everybody follows the rules, then you know what they're going to be doing in front of you, especially when that is with driving or riding a bicycle. They're turning on a bike. Almost everybody points their arm out saying, I'm turning here. So it, it makes so it better I, for what everybody. I, what I love too, uh, Ashton, uh, so uh, who, who does your, your thumbnails? Me. Yay. Good yeah. job. You're amazing. Oh, thanks. Awesome. Thanks. Awesome stuff. Um, and, and that video, the verboten one, you know, popped out at me, you know, earlier today. I haven't had a chance to to watch all your videos. Sorry. I, I've been too oh, busy okay. producing my own. <laughs> but uh, it's I was a, it's like, it's a lot of work. I get it. It's so much work. I'm I'm a one one uh, person operation, too. And so uh, it really is more than a full time job doing this. Uh, you mentioned uh, your your family and you, you mentioned, Jonathan, kids, plural. We have a surprise coming soon, right? Yeah. It's not a surprise. It's going to be arriving. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, number number 2 comes this spring. So Yay. Yeah. Fantastic. It'll Congratulations. Be a big yes. Thank you. Thank you. Very Thank good. Do you. we know what we're I having or do we or are we curious? It's a boy. We will have a second okay. boy. Yeah, our son, our older son Jack isn't going to know what's going to about, about to hit him. I think his yeah. whole world will <laughs> be rocked. Turn upside down, I think. Yeah. yeah, he's been and you know, I for better or for worse because we're so far away from family. You yeah. know, he gets un, uninterrupted mom and dad time all yeah. the time because yeah. that's just his world. And so I think he'll be in for a bit of a shock. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but we can put him outside on his kick bike and he can let him rip. <laughs> Let's just let him rip. Yeah. We, yeah. we, we jokingly, Jonathan calls him our outdoor dog because yeah. he's like outside all the time. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. where he's happiest. And so, yeah, it'll be, it'll, I think it'll be really fun. So to close us out, what I'd love to have you do is both from your own perspectives, talk a little bit about what you think a global audience can learn from the experience that you're living in when it comes to creating a culture of activity, a community that really helps embrace and encourages and designs for more natural physical activity. 
you go first? Yeah, I'll start this one. I think if people can just kind of look at their day-to-day -day activities and think about what they're doing when they're getting in their car and driving somewhere, whether they're going to the store or they're going to go and visit a friend and what they're experiencing when they're in that vehicle. Um, and then do the exact same thing again on a bicycle or just by walking and kind of rate their happiness um, and their motivation and everything at the start to finish. And I think people are gonna learn when they go somewhere under their own power and they're actually, as the Germans would say, in the nature and being outside in fresh air, like they are gonna be happier and more positive when they get there. Um, and this type of activity is something that should help empower them to ask for change, um, help the city plan for better infrastructure, for people to spend more time outside, less time in their vehicles, and take advantage of the new e-biking opportunities, specifically in the United States, because I'll use them as an example, because high-speed e-bikes are basically every single e-bike. They don't have the same regulations they have in Europe, so they can cross much bigger distances just with e-mobility than they can here in Europe. So even though the United States is much more spread out, it is harder to get places. Um, they can get a 28 mile per hour e-bike and get where they're going, I think in much more of a fun and healthy manner. Um, I mean, that would be my suggestion. Just look at how the other world manages this and look at what they're doing and think about how they could take that and apply it to their lives and help encourage change. Uh, Jonathan, yeah, I wasn't sure that, uh, or I wasn't aware of the, that limitation on the e-bike assist uh, being set so low. So I have a turn GSD, and yeah, we're it's limited at, as you mentioned, at 20 miles per hour, but yours is, it, there in Europe, it's, it's limited much, much lower. So yeah, it's, I, I'm, I was shocked, actually. Yeah, it's um, 25 kilometers an hour in Europe, which is, um, I think, what, 14 miles an hour or so, which um, unfortunately is just below the minimum speed limit you'll find in most towns, which is 30. Um, I mentioned in the video I would like e-bikes to be limited to 30 kilometers an hour just so there's not these awkward opportunities for vehicles to have to overtake them. But a lot of people in the comments did point out that a vehicle will overtake a bicycle even if they're going 30 because... They're a bicycle. They just want to get in front of them and forget about them um, because that's typical. Depending on your location, mentality. yeah. yeah. De exactly, depending on your location. Um, but you can get high-speed e-bikes in Europe that go 45 kilometers an hour um, or around 30 miles an hour, which is fast for yeah. an e-bike. And there are regulations. You need yeah. a license plate. You need mirrors. You need a horn. You need a specific helmet. You need everything. But the United States, as you pointed out, 20 miles an hour is the standard e-bike speed, um, which is pretty quick by comparison. Yeah. So Ashton, uh, I want to uh, sort of jump off of, of what Jonathan just said and, and, and reframe your question just a little bit in the sense that as, as a female and as a mom, what do communities, you know, kind of really need to do to address some of the concerns that you have? Oh, you know, I think whenever I read a lot of the comments from Americans on some of the things that we've talked about on our channel, especially when it comes to urban planning, especially when it comes to lifestyle issues, a lot of Americans, and they have a very fair point, which is, you know, I like suburbia. I like being spread out. I don't want to live next to all of that, you know, chaos and noise and activity. I don't want to live next to a parking lot. I, like that's the whole reason I'm choosing to live out in suburbia. And that comment to me always resonates is like there just seems to be um, this perception that there is this giant just canyon between the way that cities are built in Europe and the way that cities are built in the United States. And I think one of the things that I would advocate for is that there isn't as big of a difference as you think there is. And Europe was once a lot different looking too. And it just takes enough people who are willing to want to have either a cycling centric culture, or if you want to reframe it as a kid centric culture, that if enough people will push for a particular lifestyle or a particular form of mobility, then we will start to put money behind it. Then we'll start to put planning behind it. Then we'll start to put thought behind the ways that we're putting together our cities. And so from like a perspective as a mom, you know, I want our sons to grow up in a community where they feel empowered, independent, and safe. And, you know, the, the flip side of that is, is that like as a mom, 
I'm not going to be taxiing my children to practices. They can go by themselves on their bicycle. My friend, you know, they can go out with their friends and go to the ice cream shop and go to the bakery and go to school. And again, I have more freedom as a mom because I'm not spending hours of my day shuttling my children from point A to point B. And then, you know, that starts to spill into, well, if kids are on a bicycle from an early age, then again, like we talked about, you know, if, if they're on a bicycle, then when they become adults, they start looking for children on bicycles because they used to be a kid on a bicycle. And so then that becomes more safe. And it's like, there's a domino effect that starts to happen and it's possible to do it even in suburbia. You just have to have enough people who say, we want this and we want to have, you know, funding behind it and thought behind it because the spillover effect, eventually there's going to be a tipping point where it really starts to affect so many other aspects of our city. And that's something that I think is totally within reach. Yeah. Any sage advice, uh, you know, from the perspective of sort of de-escalating the narratives, because what tends to happen, you know, as you well know here, um, especially in the United States, but not, not only, I mean, we see a little bit of this in Australia and New Zealand too, is that it becomes a, an othering sort of conversation that happens. And uh, you get this fight between, you know, the the, the group that is, you know, advocating for safer communities and wanting to be able to, to be able to have all ages and abilities walk and bike to meaningful destinations. And then the other side is, is like, uh, all of a sudden outrageous with, you know, indignation of, of feeling like they're being discriminated against. Of course, they are the status quo trying to fight to keep the status quo <laughs> of motoring everywhere, driving everywhere. Any advice that you can think of, uh, either from the research that you've done, either from you know doing you know doing research and study in, in NIMBYism and, and stuff like that, but also how do we how do we kind of like lower that temperature, be able to have conflict and conversation without it devolving into us versus them. Because I don't know how productive it is if we're just warring, uh, you know, groups protesting on the streets, you know, <laughs> sending uh, insults at each other. Well, <clears throat> I would say, you know, like I said before, my research for my PhD was on low income housing and specifically the low income housing tax credit. And there was one thing that I remember a developer had said to me that I thought was like totally impactful and it was that the low income housing tax credit can be used for two types of housing. Low income housing specifically, that's for families. And that's where the majority of the NIMBY pushback is headed towards. But the second type of housing you can build with it is senior housing. And interestingly, that's the type of housing that doesn't get as much pushback because in a way, we all get old and we all get elderly and we could potentially need this type of care. And so when we're talking about active towns and creating an infrastructure, I think one of the things that makes me so excited about things like e-bikes, like I said, you know, my parents, my mom recently retired and she bought an e-bike. And I think we need to think about, you know, it's not just 30 something year old me commuting to work, but whether it's kids or whether it's the elderly or whether it's, you know, there, there are so many different members of our community that could benefit from better pedestrian and cycling infrastructure and thinking about all of the areas of life that this could hold. What, like, just, you know, when you get older, having another way to get around and be connected in your community, which is so important for your health, it's so important for your you know, whether it's physical health or even mental health of just really still, you know, not being sequestered away in a house in suburbia, but being able to go out to a coffee shop and meet a friend. And, you know, someday, hopefully not anytime soon, but I will eventually get old <laughs> and, and maybe I can't drive as well anymore, but maybe I could still ride an e-bike. And, and I think, yeah. 
I think I think that plus just looking at people on the bikes and realize these aren't just people that a lot of a lot of Americans, for example, look at somebody on a bike and look down on them because they don't have a car. They just assume, oh, they must not be able to afford a car. They're not important. Um, and that's a, a narrative I've heard more than once before. But I think people need to look at all these people trying to get around by bicycle and understand, you know, it could be a father or a mother, or a brother or a sister or a son to somebody. And like these are people that are trying to get around and. If they're upset that they're on bicycles on the road, then these drivers should also be helping ask for change, push for separated bike lanes. And if they choose to use their vehicle, which is totally fine, then they can now be on a road that is separated from the bike paths and we can all live together in harmony um, instead of just constantly battling each other, who gets to be on the road and what are the rules and all of that. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. Ashton and Jonathan, thank you so very much. It's been an absolute joy getting to know you a little bit better. I can't wait to come visit you. Yeah, yeah you please. are more than welcome. <laughs> and thank ever, you for having yeah, us on. If you ever find yourself in, in the southwestern region of Germany once more, I know you said you're going to be up by Leipzig. That's quite a distance from here. Yeah. But uh, if you ever find yourself in the Black Forest, please let us know. You, you have someone that you can for sure come and visit anytime. And we'll find a bike. And we'll find well, a bike. And, well, I'll have my bike with me. I always travel with my folding bike with me. So uh, I, I always have a, a bike when I get off the train. I can just roll right uh, into the into the town, into the village. And uh, yeah, what a joy. It would be fun to, uh, you know, do an on-bike interview when that happens. That would be awesome. That would be my favorite <laughs> kind of interview. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Well, again, thank you so very much. And congratulations once again on the success of the Black Forest Family YouTube channel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us tonight. This was really great. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Ashton and Jonathan. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, <laughs> leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. And I do need to send a huge thank you out to uh, several of you who are watching this channel. Uh, actually recommended the Black Forest family as a YouTube channel that I should see and check out and ask if they would be interested in coming on the podcast. And they were. It worked. <laughs> Again, thank you so much for tuning in and that suggestion. And please keep those suggestions coming. They are very, very helpful. And uh, until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.